pediatric speech language pathologist and welcome to teach me to talk the podcast I am so excited about today's show and if you are listening you can't tell that there's a big difference today but if you are watching uh, via YouTube on video you can see that I'm surrounded by toys and so we're trying something new on the podcast today and I've wanted to do it for a long time so I'm so glad that I could have props and this is the one of the main reasons that we switched from an audio only format so that we can do some video too. And so if you liked Therapy Tip of the Week and if you liked seeing demos of things, uh, watch the video. So that's just a little, uh, just kind of a little forerunner for what we're about to do and especially for podcast listeners. So you might wanna think, "Mm, I better watch the video so that I can see what's really, really going on. Today, I'm going to teach you seven steps for introducing pretend play to toddlers and young preschoolers. This is such important information for we as pediatric speech language pathologists and other early interventionists. So many of the children we see, particularly those with red flags for autism or children who've already been diagnosed with ASD, have such a hard time making that jump from really concrete play to pretend play. And sometimes we jump way ahead and as therapists and certainly as parents, we start at the very beginning when it's so hard. And one of the things that I've really, really tried to do in my practice is break down and make things super sequential, take a lot of complex information and and make it super, super usable. So I hope that that's what we're going to accomplish in today's podcast. So number one, the very first step that we do when we are introducing pretend play to toddlers is help a child learn to use familiar toys appropriately or functionally. So what does that mean? It means that we're going to be teaching a child how to use a toy for the purpose it's intended. Now sometimes when I talk about this with parents, especially our teacher parents, (laughs) or if I'm talking about it with another therapist, I can sort of feel the resistance go up because they'll say something like, well, I don't want to discourage creativity or I don't really want to jump in and force anything with play. You know, (laughs) sometimes you do have to think about, we have to start at the beginning and before a child can be creative with blocks or before a child can be creative with a piece of paper, he needs to know what the real function is or what the intended purpose is. And again, this is just looking at the world from a very, very concrete perspective. And we cannot start with something abstract like pretend play until we are sure that a toddler has mastered more concrete concepts. So if that's been a problem for you, and if you haven't known how to explain it, if you're a therapist, or if you're a parent and you've just had that internal urge like, oh, I don't know if I should be directing this, or directing this play in this way. Think about it like this. You really wouldn't let a child not brush his teeth, or you really wouldn't let a child not wear clothes uh, in public, right? Especially if it were cold. So think about it that way. You're going to really, really teach play. Again, it's a very sequential, very logical, very step-by-step-by-step process. So we start, even when we're looking at pretending in a really solid, real world, concrete, purposeful place. And so we wanna teach kids how to play with objects, again, with their intended function. So that means that, let's just take a common toy like a ball. What do you do with the ball? Well, you can do lots with the ball. You can roll it, you can throw it, you can kick it, those kinds of things. What would you do with a car? You would teach a child to push a car, to roll a car, to crash a car, those kinds of things. Now, some of you are already thinking, "Uh, that's great, but my kid can't really get beyond that. What do you do? Well, let me teach you how I do this in therapy and how most other therapists, I think, approach play, particularly when a child does not understand how to play. And again, this can happen with children with autism. It can happen with toddlers with uh, significant cognitive issues, whether or not they have a medical diagnosis to to accompany that or not. So many of our little friends with Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, or any kind of neurological difference or brain 
difference and again this would be a medical diagnosis that if you're watching as a parent you know that your child already has a diagnosis that would uh, result in him having differences in how he learns and how he thinks and how he remembers so lots of times we do have to think about teaching play in the same way that we teach other things very directly very purposefully and we're we're really not going to leave it to chance that they learn how to play and that's what happens a lot of times with parents of children who are language delayed we focus so hard on helping them learn how to talk that we don't realize that the other prerequisite skills that go into talking like understanding what words mean or understanding how the world works understanding what objects are for we don't really tie that in with language. We don't make that connection. So as pediatric speech language pathologists, we have to help parents make that connection and help parents understand why we're working on what we're working on and how that all leads to what our bigger goals are. And today we are talking about play, but again, let me connect play with language for you. Uh, pretend play is a really big indicator that a child will be able to use words and will be able to be a functional communicator and use language. And if you think about it, pretend play is helping a child learn to become symbolic, meaning that one object represents another object. That's what words are. You know, this isn't a car just because we, uh, you know, it, it came to us as this is a car. This is a car because people years and years and years ago developed that name for car. It was a symbol. It became a representative of what this object is. And so again, when a child can't do that when he can't make that cognitive connection during play he's going to have a really really hard time with words and a really hard time using language in a very functional way and that's why so many children with autism too really struggle to learn how to play because they are thinking so concretely they don't really get to that symbolic level without a lot of help or until they're much older and so we really really have to help that develop and again we're starting at the beginning with using toys appropriately and functionally so so when a kid's not playing, when he's not doing much beyond rolling a ball, rolling a car, or those initial baby toys where they're shaking rattles or really playing with things that are totally fidgety that they can also mouth, some kids have a really hard time in this earliest toddler uh, developmental period learning how to play with uh, more difficult toys and I think about these as one turn toys meaning that you take a turn you model and show the child how to use the toy and then he takes a turn and then you take a turn and then he takes a turn and at this point too you can't really do a lot of like I said before leaving it to chance you can't just put him in front of a toy and say play <laughs> and expect that he'll know what to do if that were going to happen it would have already happened and you would not be as a parent searching for videos on YouTube with how to help your child learn to play and talk and as a therapist there would be absolutely no reason for you to be involved with the family if the child is moving along well enough to do some of these things on his own and that's how I explain it to parents to parents who are a little bit resistant to working on playing and they're thinking you're supposed to be helping me teach him how to talk why are you wasting our time here that's what you do and that's how you explain it and you say you know this really requires that we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one direct teaching so when we have a child who again is not really playing with toys and we're starting at this fundamental level the the steps that I do here is to set out the toy between me and the child and again you could do it at a table but I, I'm just a floor kind of therapist uh, one of my courses is called early speech language development taking theory to the floor so I'm down there where they are right you know eye to eye and face to face and if you're a parent who's not really really doing that I highly encourage you to do that get on the floor get down there it makes a big big difference and so make sure that the child can see you and one thing that you want to do even as you're helping him focus on the toy is still include you during play and the best ways to do that are to make your face exciting to watch and make your voice exciting to listen to. So many times, especially our little friends again with autism or who have red flags for autism, uh, I read this article years ago that said, children with autism do not naturally enjoy the sound of the human voice. Oh, 
What a true statement. So many times those little friends tune out language and they are much more focused on objects than on people. And so to get yourself in there and to make sure that you are included as the helper or the teacher or the facilitator or the assistant, or if you wanna think about it as the play partner, you have to, again, do everything that you can to be sure that a child notices you there. And then this also is a big, big component of modeling or teaching. You want him to watch you. You don't want him to get so involved in the toy that he's not learning from you, that he's kind of still doing his own thing, that he's mentally checking out. Even though you are there with him and your physical body is present, you want him really, really uh, maintaining that you're part of this play routine too. So that's super, super important. And remember that kids learn how to talk from other people, not necessarily from these toys, not from electronic games or apps or anything like that. So you are a vital part of teaching a child how to play and how to understand words and how to talk. And that's a certainly another reason that as therapists, we do everything we can to involve parents in therapy. You know, we don't do the model where the parents just kind of come in and drop the kids off and say, see ya, I'll be back. Some programs are like that, but really this direct one-on-one -on -one intervention is where we need to be focused, particularly for children who aren't playing yet and aren't, aren't talking at all when they're in that nonverbal phase. So we, I'm here and I have my child right in front of me and I'm making sure that I am within his line of vision that he can see me, which means that if he is still pretty much down on the floor, Boy, I do everything I can to get myself down too. Now that was a lot easier when I was 25 and 30 and now that I'm in my 50s, it's a little harder to sometimes uh, negotiate where, where I need to be and get my own body down there. But it's really, really important that you do that. And if you have a kid that's continually getting lower than you, that you just can't, he just can't see you or watch you, one thing that I also do is maybe put a child up on a low table, like a coffee table, if I'm in a, a family's home, or put a kid on a couch and then I sit on the floor. And even if the toy is between us, he's kind of leaned back against the cushions, my face is still right there, right in line with the toy. So that's another tip if a child is uh, not really looking at you and not really including you. All right, so you've got him right across from you. And what you wanna do, again, is you're talking but don't over talk, especially to children who are struggling to master this earliest level of play. And so you'll just keep your words really simple, but again, your voice super fun to listen to and your face uh, fun for a child to watch. You've got to give him, again, a reason to include you. So do things like model what you're doing. And again, I'm going to show you with a few toys because I think I, I get the best feedback from parents who say, you know, I really didn't know how to do it until I saw you do it, until I watched one of your DVDs or uh, until I watched a video on YouTube. I did not understand how I was supposed to really try, you know, or they'll say, no wonder it's working better for you than it did for me at home because you're really trying. You know, I didn't realize I had to try so hard yes you do you do have to try pretty hard so that's another thing that we need to remember as therapists to really model that effort for parents and sometimes we've lost that in in this consultative model that so many states have gone to for early intervention programs where the the mandate is that we don't really work with a child directly that we just encourage a parent how to do or we encourage a parent or sh or talk to a parent about how to do it but we don't do any direct treatment anymore i so disagree with that we certainly are training parents but the very best way to train a parent and to educate a parent and help them know what to do is for them to watch us and us show them what to do and then to bring them into that so that they are with us and then they are mo they are also modeling how to teach a child play and then we are are helping them make their own adjustments so that they can maximize their own success uh, with their own child so again we've got the kid here and you are on the other side of that and you are within his line of vision and you're ready to go. And so you would just tell the child what to do with the toy as you were demonstrating. So for this old ball toy that I love, that I've had for years and years and years, you know, you would say something like, watch, look, see, we pull, oh, ball, got the ball. 
And again, you're keeping the child engaged with how you look and how you sound, and you're teaching him exactly what to do. And so then you might model it another time or two where you put the ball in and you say, you know, push ball, pull, and then, oh, got it. Something like that. Get a verbal routine going where you're saying lots of the same words at the same time in the same way. And then when it's the child's turn, you could do a couple things. You could just wait and see what happens. But at this level, I really don't. I'm still providing some uh, cueing so that I'm showing a child exactly what to do. So I would probably, with this toy, hand him the ball and say, you put it in, look, right here ball goes in help him do it because you don't want to lose him you don't want to give him time to grab the ball and get up and run to another part of the room or grab the ball and throw it where he's not still staying with you using the toy in the intended way so get him to put it in and then you'll encourage him to pull and again you can start with telling him and pointing but you also may have to take his little hand and physically help him pull the ball and operate the toy that way when his attention starts to wane get another toy and at this level it's super super important that you are thinking about how many different motor actions you're teaching a child so think about with the first toy that we used what were we doing we were putting the ball in so we're placing one object in another inside another and then we're also pulling so what would be some other actions you could do so look at the toys that you're using and that are available because remember at this earliest stage of play one of the things that you're really teaching is how to use different motor actions and so for some children that will be harder because of their natural limitations if they have gross or fine motor delays if they have uh, muscular differences in their differences in their muscle tone in their little bodies they could have low tone or higher tone like some of our little guys with cerebral palsy that's another thing that you're doing is teaching them how to use their bodies in different ways some of our little friends with motor planning problems not only have motor planning problems here uh, at the oral or verbal level with their mouths they also have or, uh, more motor planning problems here with how they use their hands with uh, gross and fine motor actions. So play with them is, is so difficult not only cognitively because of the way they're, they're just slower to learn these things and don't always think or process information in the ways that we would expect because of their developmental delays, but they also have another overlay issue in that their little bodies don't always work like they want to, them to work. And so even if when they want to do the same kind of uh, action that you've done in play, they can't figure out how to do it. So that's another reason that doing this really direct teaching of play will be super, super helpful. So look for other actions you can do. So uh, with a bell, you're shaking, okay? And then with, say, this lollipop drum here, you're beating, okay? And then you can move on to things, again, that are a little more complex. So something like this piggy bank toy where we put the ball in, but now we have a different shaped um, object here. We've got the coin, and so we put the coin in, and then we pull. And the whole time, again, we're talking with the child about what's going on. We're modeling the play, but we're also making sure that we're included in the play. And we're looking for lots of different actions to accomplish because we want to make sure that that motor piece is moving along too. So for this cute little porcupine toy that I just got yesterday, just bought this uh, off Amazon, think about this, you know, putting a child has to pick up the pieces and I love this because the little porcupine quills have finger indentations. So for our children who are struggling with fine motor, our kids who aren't pointing or who use a, a full-handed point may need some extra practice like this. Again, not from just the, the play perspective, what I do with this toy, but even fine motor practice. So great way to do that and keep the kid with you, keep him involved with you, keep him learning and doing different actions. Now this is a new toy that I just received too that I think is super, super cool, especially for our little friends who have strong visual preferences. That means what? 
they like to look at how things move. They're super interested in, say, how the wheels move on Thomas or how a ceiling fan moves. And they spend lots of time maybe opening and closing the cabinet doors in the kitchen because they're looking at the hinge and figuring out how that operates. Or a kid who just has his little face down on his iPad or he's, he's just up on the big screen TV. Those kids have uh, strong visual preferences when they're learning. So sometimes with toys, frankly, they're just not enough bang for their buck. So you've got to use some toys that are more visually interesting to get things going. So I love this little toy. So if I were playing with a child here, again, I would have the toy between the child and me. I would have my face right down here and I would show them what to do. I would say something like, look, see, goes on. Wee! Down, 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 down. And then you give the child a turn too. And so look at your toys and look at the materials that you're using because sometimes, again, in this, in this, crazy age that we've gotten in with early intervention where we've decided that <clears throat> we can't take new and interesting toys into a family's home. We only have to use what's there. Sometimes kids aren't playing with toys because there's really nothing to play with. <laughs> so you have to really talk to parents about that and really encourage them. And I am not slamming using natural environments or using what a family already has. And I'm certainly not uh, not being condescending or anything about a family's lack of resources. I'm just saying if we're teaching a child how to play with toys, we have to have more than, you know, a shoe and a, a broken whatever kind of toy. So really talk with parents about that too, how, how they can bring additional materials in and, and, and the value in that and what, what, what they can do to get that going. All right, so that was the step that was the first phase and I forgot to say when we're doing all of this as soon as a child imitates or copies what you want him to do with a toy you've got to praise him you've got to let him know that that was fantastic and you've got to keep that going so again make sure that a child is completing several turns with a toy and that he really knows how to do it so uh, lots of parents do get more successful with play like this when they pre-plan their activities and when they think well I'm going to get these three or four different toys and this is what we'll work on this week. This is my little set of toys for my home therapy time. And again, some therapists have shied away from recommending that to parents because they feel like that's not as natural. But I tell you what, I don't know of a more everyday routine that a child should be participating in other than playing with toys. I mean, that's how children learn everything. And so help a parent structure that a little more. <clears throat> again, so they are facilitating and really, really maximizing their one-on-one -on -one time with a child. And it doesn't have to be hours and hours at a time. Just a little 15 or 20 minute play session in the morning, in the afternoon, uh, will we'll just go a long way, not only toward teaching a child how to play, but then again, our ultimate goal, which is teaching him how to understand words and use words. All right, that was step number one. Step number two, we're gonna move beyond these kinds of toys and we're going to teach a child how to use use a variety of familiar objects on himself or herself. So think about it in this way. And this is sort of a natural extension of what we did with these kinds of toys. And now we're sort of moving to toys that again are going to form the basis for pretend play. So what I like to do is gather lots of everyday items. Now you can do things like dishes, you can do things like toy foods. But I had the most success initially with, with things that, again, are so easy for a child to know that he or she is supposed to use that item on himself or on herself. So something like sunglasses. And as you see, I have here a really cool backpack. And this has been helpful for me too when I want to introduce uh, these kinds of items. You don't just really have them out randomly. You want to gather them so that again, you've got a structure and a beginning, a middle and an end for this play routine. So that you're really helping a child again, learn to stay with you and learn to what to expect and get in the habit of listening to you and including you there. So put your items in a little backpack. And again, I try to keep what I want the child to get first on top. And so I would say something like, whoa, look, see Elmo, what's in here? Let's see, let's see. And then let him reach in and grab one of the objects. And as a therapist, you may have 
forgotten that kids have to use these items on themselves long before they're able to use, say, items on a doll or items with another child. So we have to start at the beginning. So you wanna gather things that a kid, again, can use himself. So things like sunglasses, super, super effective. And if you haven't had, if you've had trouble with a child and you haven't had much luck with getting a child to do this sort of thing before, I tell you, sunglasses and hats, especially kind of silly hats <laughs> that they've never seen before, are a super, super way to do it. And you'll do just what we did in step one with those functional toys. You'll introduce these items one at a time, give the child an opportunity to use it on himself, You'll tell him, show him, help him. So again, you'll say something like, wow, it's a hat. What are you going to do with that hat? And you may show him how to do it on you, but your goal first is for him to do it on himself. And so then really, really encourage him to take the hat and put it on his own head. And so things like that I have in my little starter kit here, uh, and, and I call, I've called this for a long time a pretend with me backpack. I got that name from a colleague a long time ago and it's, it's really, really stuck. And it's a great way to talk to parents about what your intended goal here is. And again, you wanna talk to them about, this is how pretend play develops. We start with functional toys and then using in, them in the way that they're intended. And then we move to these familiar items that they use on themselves. So other things that are super, super effective, a hairbrush so that a child can brush her own hair. Then you move to things that you probably have thought about as more, um, more along this line. But I'm telling you things like glasses, hats, brushes, toothbrushes, pretend toothbrushes that can easily be wiped off, that don't have the real bristles that are so hard to clean. Um, Cause you know a kid's gonna put it in his mouth and that's what he's supposed to do. That's, what, that's the purpose of using this kind of toy. But, but present those and then move on to things like cups, you know, where a child pretends to drink. Uh, move on to things like a bowl and a fork or spoon. One thing that I really like to model at this level is stirring. We're kind of getting ahead of ourselves because we'll sort of do that a couple steps later. The kids like that and they'll start to really, really imitate it. So for here, with a spoon and a bowl, what would you want a child to do? Feed himself, you know, pretend like he's eating. Uh, drink out of the cup too. Another really fun thing to do that I like at this level is to have a blanket and you can just get these if you don't have them, you know, cheapo at Walmart or the dollar store, just anywhere. Just use something you already have at home and have him pretend to cover himself up like he's going to sleep. You can introduce a cute little social game there with a night-night routine uh, where, you know, once he's covered up, you can say, oh, you're sleeping and then pretend like he's snoring and then the whole one, two, three, wake up, which is a super, super fun routine uh, that I just hardly ever cannot get a kid to do. I mean, they all like it, even when there are significant issues going on because it's, uh, it's something they do every day and they recognize it and it's super familiar. Other things that are a little higher level for this step in teaching for template, things like lotion, uh, things like baby wipes where you get a wipe out and you have a child uh, wash himself and then band-aids are always a super fun thing for kids to do too when you're having them uh, put the band-aids on themselves all right so you already know where this is going right after a child does all of that on himself what do you think comes next Step three in this is where a child learns to use these same familiar objects on another person. Now, if you're a therapist, you naturally think he's gonna use that on you because you're showing a, a child how to do it. But honestly, you're gonna have better luck if you have him do it on his mom. And this is, again, a super, super way to bring this uh, a parent into therapy and to have them participate. And I constantly get emails from therapists uh, at my website at Teach Me To Talk that say, how do I get parents to participate? How can I get them off their phones? How can I get them to stay in the room with us? How do they, how can I get them during a home visit not to try to go start a load of dishes or take a shower or tend to the other children? This is how you do it. You say, you are your child's play partner today and we are working our pretend play and he's learned how to use all these objects on himself and now he's got to learn how to use these objects on another person. Person and mom, you are it. I want you to sit here with us and really, really participate because this is so important to his therapy. And guys, I just hardly 
can think of an example when a parent has refused that, when you are really offering a reason for them to participate, when you were saying, you know, I am here just as much for you as I am for your child, and so that you help them understand why they need to be a part of this. And so you just do the same thing. You know, I've already had all these objects out, you know, you're starting in a new session with this. Sometimes children will naturally sort of move on themselves and begin as soon as they take the hairbrush out, they brush their own hair for a minute and then they automatically start to uh, brush your hair. You're not going to say, no, 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 we're not up to step three, stop. You're going to let them naturally evolve and let that process go ahead and continue so that they are uh, again, including another person in play. And parents are the natural, natural extension of that. So involve parents with this. And really talk to parents too about how to be super animated and reactive so that when a child puts the hat on their head, they're not just sitting there. You know, give them some ideas of what to do. You know, you, you could say, you know, that's so funny. Why don't you try to sneeze that hat off your head? You know, ah, 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 chew, which kids think is hysterical. If you've never done that, please implement that practice right away because it does help the kid focus on you and he wants to do it again and again and again and then he'll hopefully start to kind of reverse the roles again and do that on on himself and try to imitate your vocalization so look what you've done there you've really progressed and moved that whole um whole process along where you've, you've started as play there but you're also getting him to imitate a play sound so super super effective way to do that um, I love think talking with parents about this too but you know one of the things that we have to say when, when children are learning to use objects on especially another person is for us to keep our expectations super low and we probably should have already said that even at the previous step where a child is using the object on himself or even back with some of these toys, these one-turn toys that we were teaching a child how to take his turn, keep your expectations low. You're not gonna be disappointed <laughs> when you just only expect for a child to say, put the hat on one or two times and then wanna move on to something else. That is fine. No child would sit there with you and play with the same hat. I mean, that would also be maybe problematic that he couldn't move on to a new toy. So just a couple of, sometimes even a minute with a toy, and then that's why you've got them all gathered. You're gonna move on to the next toy, move on to the next toy, and talk with parents about that, and that they should not be unrealistic with their expectations that a child will sit and use the same toy you know, for 15 minutes at a time. That, that's just totally not going to happen, especially with a child who's not naturally uh, a good player on his own, who hasn't already acquired these skills in a more natural learning process. So talk to parents about that too. Let me say that too, with children at this step where kids are learning how to use objects on someone else, this is so challenging for children who don't naturally include other people in play. And so if you have a, a toddler, again, who has red flags for autism or who's already been diagnosed with autism or who you know in your heart, oh, he's gonna get this diagnosis. I know this is why he's not talking. I know this is why he's not communicating. He's not interacting with people. This will be a hard step for them to learn to include the other person. And so that's why if I'm, if I'm having this difficulty where a child really is sort of fixated on still using the objects on himself, I know that I've got to back up. And I know that I've got to teach him to want to be with other people and how to enjoy that, that interaction and that social connection. So for those kids, you have to back up and do a lot of playing where you are the toy where you are uh, the, the only thing that they're focused on in little social games like ring around the rosies or ride a little horsey or row row your boat or even something like patty cake or, you know, you may try playing patty cake where you're patting your hands, you know, he holds up his hands and you hold up your hands and where you're patting like that. And so think about that. So if a child's really having difficulty at this level, back up so that you are included in those social games and so that you're using those little social routines and then you get him really, really interested and really, really consistently including another person and then you go back to this step in pretend play. So I wanted to give you a little troubleshooting tip there. Now another problem happens here with children who like to 
as I lovingly say, hoard. <laughs> they want to hold all the toys. So back with our backpack, they are really, really not wanting to let go of that backpack. They want, again, their arm is usually up like a shield right there where they are holding you off and not wanting to do that. Well, sometimes with those children, you have to have two sets of objects. So make sure there are two hairbrushes and two pretend toothbrushes and two hats and two blankets and two cups and just go through and do pairs like that because it's going to be even harder for some of those kids. Sometimes though one object will work better and you think well I'm just going to bite the bullet here and we're just we're going to learn how to turn tag. Parents refer to that as sharing but you really talk about how it's more difficult for them to take turns and how they are just intrinsically motivated to play with everything themselves and again for these kids you really have to back up to that social interaction piece and get that going more consistently with social games. All right, so don't forget when uh, kids are learning how to use those objects on another person, the way that mom could do that is for her to really use the object on her child. And so if he is not naturally giving her a drink, she should take the cup back with the backpack and you know, give him a little drink. And she wants to keep it super playful. You know, she'll get the cup and, oh, that's so yummy. Mm, mm, mm. And then here's, here's your turn. And then give the other child a drink too. And so, uh, or give the child a drink too. And so that's one of the things that you're going to want to do with this too, is uh, help anticipate what the problems would be. And then give moms and dads solutions for that. So uh, again, another thing you can do here at this level is to what I just modeled interject yourself right there so if a child is really fixated on say feeding himself and he doesn't ever want to give you a bite and you've already done the whole oh i'm hungry i want a bite give me a bite and he doesn't respond put yourself in there just kind of jump right in if he's got the spoon oh boy just you know get your mouth down there and say oh, nom, 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 nom. oh my turn i eat or something like that and again make it as playful as you can make it don't be super demanding in that you're saying I must have a turn. You have to learn how to share with mommy. You have to share with your friends at school. Don't do all that. Just make yourself a really, really fun play partner so that he wants to include you there at that, um, at that level. And anything you can do that's silly or unexpected, so pretend, okay, let's say that he's going to give you a bite of pretend food and he expects you to eat it and act like you like it. Act like you don't like it. Act like you're grossed out. You know, say, Bleh! or, you know, pretending, ugh, ugh. Ugh, yuck, yuck. He'll want to feed you and he'll want to do it over and over and over again. So you know your child as a parent and as a therapist, you certainly have your instincts where you know what a child will respond to. If you're not getting a good reaction or include, he's not including you, think, what can I do differently? How can I make this more exciting for him? What would make him more likely to include me here? So make sure that you're super playful, again, and animated. And that usually does the trick. When you, as I always say, you know, ratchet it up a notch. When you try harder, if you were at, a, say, a level four on your excitement scale, you know, go to a six or go to a seven and see if that doesn't help a child want to respond. All right, so we let's review a little bit. We started out by teaching children how to play purposefully and functionally with toys. That was step number one. Step number two is that they took some familiar items and began to use them on themselves. We just did step number three, where a child learned how to use objects on another person. Now we're up to step number four, where a child is learning to use items on a doll or a character. So start with the same kinds of items that you just had in the other um, set of materials, a brush, um, a bottle is always a super, super way to get this going with uh, toddlers too because they all understand that babies take bottles. So, you know, again, model for a child what to do at the beginning. You'll take your bottle and you'll do <coughs> baby drinks, baby drinks bottle. <coughs> You, you do it. You give the baby a bottle. You give baby a drink and then give a child a turn to do that. 
and just go through the, the items that we did before. You know, pull your things out one at a time out of the backpack. I love using potato head glasses on dolls because kids think that is hysterical. And again, a lot of times children will then want to do it on themselves and then do it on you. And that's fantastic. Don't feel like, oh, we're going backwards here. Kids will kind of move through this and they have to always practice to gain mastery at those easier, earlier levels. So think about how you can do that. And remember, when you first start to introduce a doll or a character, kids are going to, going to naturally uh, want to go a little bit fast. They, like we talked about before, keep your expectations pretty low. So he may only give the doll a couple of drinks from the bottle before he is ready to move on. So have the next thing ready. And if it really worked well, the backpack method there, go ahead and do that here for baby dolls too. Have your whole little baby doll set so that you have lots of extra things to do. I'll tell you other things that are really successful with baby dolls. Um, we talked about the higher level things with the other backpack. Lotion and band-aids work, but little doll clothes work really well and I'll tell you it's not always doll clothes that that you put on the baby it's when you let a child take the doll clothes off so you may talk about at the beginning things like oh sock look at this sock see where's the sock go and then you're cueing a child and you let him show you you know on her foot and then you put the socks on or I have the diaper here put the diaper on the baby and then or maybe a hat everything you're doing and again as you were doing this with a child you are narrating you are keeping your words fun so that you're helping him focus his attention but it is so much more effective to deconstruct here where you're having a child take the objects or take the clothing items off first before he tries to put them on. And kids actually think this is funny. And you know, children naturally want those baby dolls to be naked. <laughs> so they are more inclined to participate with you if you do the dressing and do it fast or have the doll already dressed and say, uh, you know, what are we gonna do? Oh, what should we do with their hat? Look, it's her hat. I promise a child is going to naturally reach up and try to remove these things. And this is really referred to as a process called deconstruction. And if you've watched my other Therapy Tip of the Week videos, I've done some things uh, with this. If you uh, got the therapy manual, let's talk about talking. I have a huge section about deconstruction in the whole um, process of teaching children how to play. We don't always start with putting things together. We start with taking things apart. And that's a necessary step, even here in teaching pretend play. And let me just say, way back at level one, where you were teaching children to use objects purposefully or functionally, for some of those kids, you may, and if you're, and if you're watching this and you're thinking, you're watching it maybe for the second time or the third time or whatever, because you're trying to remember these tips or you're, you're really struggling with the child, you may do a lot of deconstruction even back at this way back at step one or, or when you get here to this level with the child and you just you're you're just stuck go back or if you have a child who doesn't have to maintain any kind of attention or focus go back to this level at the very beginning and work on deconstructing and taking the pieces out instead of putting the pieces in and so again a super super tip there for you all right so we've gotten up to step four where we are using the items on a doll or a character and let me just say too if a child is resistant to using a baby doll you can use any kind of character to teach this if he loves a, a paw patrol puppy get one of those puppies and have the puppy eat and have the puppy drink and you can pretend like you're brushing the puppy's hair and you can brush the puppy's teeth use whatever character he likes uh, i had a kid one time who loved spongebob and he had a spongebob pillow and we used uh we did all of this with spon th that spongebob pillow and again does it make a ton of sense to you as an adult no <laughs> your preference would be probably that he did use a baby doll but you've got to meet him where he is so even thomas the train i've done this kind of thing with kids where i'm taking the train and thomas is eating and we are 
washing Thomas with the baby wipe and saying, oh, we're giving Thomas a bath, wash, wash, wash. Or we're making Tom, we're feeding Thomas with a spoon. So you can certainly do that with any kind of character. If, if you know, a lot, this happened a long time ago. It doesn't really happen as much anymore. But sometimes dads might be a little bit resistant to their uh, sons playing with dolls. You can do this with a G.I. Joe. Or you can do, if dad doesn't even like those, Again, try another character. We are teaching symbolism here. So what, whatever you can find for a child to do, that's certainly uh, worth your effort to, to figure out what would work for this family and for this child. And really, really walk parents through that about with maybe their own little misgivings about some things and really explain what you're doing and what your purpose is. And you'll get much less resistance when a parent understands what your goal is and what your intention is there. All right, so when we were teaching a child how to use items on a dollar a character, you know, it was a natural extension of what we did with taking those same familiar objects and having him use them on himself and then on you, and now we're at a dollar a character. But some kids really have such a hard time at this level, and the reason is because we are expecting them to combine objects or combine ideas. Now stay with me for a minute because as a therapist I'm going to explain some things to you that even as a speech language pathologist you might not have put together yet. Kids have to know how to combine toys or combine objects and use them together before they are ever able to combine words into phrases. All right, do you get that? Do you understand that connection there? They've got to be able to join two ideas. So if you have a kid who is having lots of difficulty moving from single words to phrases, one of the things that you need to consider is that cognitively, he's just not there yet. He doesn't understand how to combine objects. And we'll see that a lot with kids in play, where they may have something like this car or a tractor or, or a school bus, and you want to put the character in the bus. So you say, oh, let's let the farmer drive the tractor. Farmer's turn, farmer sit down, or you know, dada, or whatever you're calling your character. And you have a kid that just immediately jerks that character out and doesn't want to do anything except lay down on his belly and watch those wheels spin. He is not ready developmentally to move on to phrases. And you've gotten that information from watching him play. And you know, play is the very best window into how a child's cognition is developing. And so when you know that you, you can't get a kid to include the, the dad, or he won't hook a trailer onto the truck, you know that that kid is having difficulty combining. And so you have got to help him make that developmental leap or he's never gonna to get to phrases. And so that might be a heads up for some of you if you have some children who are really, really stuck at that single word level and you haven't paid enough attention to their play skills. So back up and help them learn cognitively or out here mentally, however you wanna think about it, help them do that here at a really concrete level so that they can get to that point symbolically with words. All right, so here we are. We've done a lot of those combinations with the doll, but now we're ready to try to move this along and help children learn how to combine other kinds of objects. I've already mentioned we can take a tr some kind of vehicle and put a person in there, so a pretend character in there. Other things that we can do, natural extensions of what we've just talked about with uh, the baby doll. You can have an animal, you know, pretend to eat and drink. You know, be sure that you're using your sound effects and again, doing everything you can to include yourself in that play. And remember that you have to model what a child should do, meaning that you have to show him. You can't just, like we said back with these more functional toys in step one, you can't just hand him the toys and expect that he'll know what to do. You've really got to show him. Uh, and that is part of that tell him, show him, help him. And so with, these, with this kind of, uh, at this, this stage of teaching for play, any kind of little toy that you can use is super, super like a truck or uh, like a pretend animal that we already talked about those scenarios. But I've gotten really good luck 
with other kinds of toys like dollhouse furniture that look very, very similar, look really, really real. And so uh, get yourself some of these. I bought these today at Dollar Tree. And this is really convenient for me since our new office is right beside Dollar Tree. But just look for these kinds of toys. And again, if you're thinking, I don't have any kid on my caseload who's developmentally ready to play with dollhouse toys yet think about how you can use that and again how this is just the natural extension and so you don't have to use the 35 pieces yet you'll pull out these very basic pieces like a chair or like a bed and talk with the child and really introduce this kind of play over and over and don't forget about the things that have been so successful so when we are at this level of play and we're helping a kid learn how to combine objects, we go back to playing night night where we are teaching a child to take his little character and put the character to sleep. And so you use that same little routine that you've already done where you say, you know, oh, it's Bob. Bob is so sleepy. It's time to go to bed. Night night, Bob. You know, where's his bed? And then have the child find the bed or look toward the bed. And then you'll say, let's put Bob in bed and give the child an opportunity to do it. And then do your whole routine where you're patting Bob and saying pat, pat, pat. And where you're saying, shh, Bob's sleeping. Oh, listen, listen, Bob can snore. You know, shh, shh, and do that whole routine. And then you'll say, oh, I think Bob wants to wake up and do your fun counting here. One, two, three, wake up you know when you're getting Bob up and so don't forget about the little social routines and social games that have worked things that a child likes to do with you now pull that into characters and this actually leads us to the sixth step which is animating a doll or a character so that I'm sorry I've gotten ahead of myself this is still at level five this is animating a doll or a character so that they can perform these kinds of uh, pretend play things. And again, now you are finally at the level where you're starting to think about, yeah, this really is pretending. <laughs> this really is what we were going for. But again, don't make your expectations so unrealistic. For some kids, we have to stay at this level for a long, 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 long time. Now this naturally emerges with children. Um, if they're typically developing by, between two and two and a half. And for our guys who have language delays, a lot of times they are closer to three or certainly two and a half to three or even beyond before they're really mastering this and incorporating this. And again, we're just talking about the easiest, earliest levels where we're having uh, our little character here pretend like he's sleeping in bed, and but we're not doing the whole dollhouse routine yet. We're not having that he's gonna sleep in bed first and then he'll go sit in the chair you know for some kids they need to stay with this individual level where they play with the bed and bob for a while and then you like we did with the backpack where you then you move on to oh we have the chair and bob is in the chair and some kids won't even be able to do that in the context of the the playhouse and so sometimes we we have you know these really cool sets where, which are fantastic by the way but you may have to really pull these items out and really teach this direct teaching like we've already talked about pretty structured for a long time before you're able to add that next component up and we're going to put these pieces in the house and and do all that together for some kids it's just too hard so think about how you can pull those items out and use these uh, use these pieces individually and so get a child used to that so let's say that we were having our little character here and we had the chair and we had the bed and, but let's just say that he still really kind of wants to blow through these things pretty quickly. Go ahead and bring out some of those earlier items, like a spoon, like the cup, like um, a, a new, uh, something, that, a piece of cloth that's a blanket here. You're gonna cover him up. So you would add the steps, but just in one tiny little context. Again, if you put Bob in the chair and you were gonna feed him or the farmer, you're gonna feed the dad dad some supper that's what you're doing you're keeping it again you're adding steps but it's not you know and we're going to go get the easy bake oven and we're going to make a pretend cake and we're going to don't do all that yet keep it pretty simple and pretty focused and use what you know about the kid use what he already liked to do if he enjoyed putting hats on do the hats with uh with your little character here if he enjoyed uh, the baby wipe, washing himself with the baby wipe or washing you with the baby wipe. Use the baby wipe here with the dada. So really think about it. Think about how can I take this new little piece, which is combining objects, and how can I 
um, what's the next little thing that I can bring in that's not going to be too hard, that's not going to want to make this child flee and escape and avoid what I want him to do. So think about that. Think about how what worked back at step two and step three. How can I incorporate that way up here at step five? And so when a kid is ready, when he's doing several of those things, that's when you go ahead again and start to really think about uh, putting all of these little pieces together. So that's when you start to act out familiar schemes or themes. So this would be at the time where you introduce, uh, you know, it's time to eat, Daddy, and then you have the little table and the little chair and where you are helping Daddy eat when, and bringing in the pretend food. So that's kind of the point where we bump it up. And again, kids have to stay here a long time. Don't get too frustrated here. Add additional props as necessary to help them really, really learn how to combine objects. Another thing that I like to do here too is really bring in some more realistic everyday items. So things like housekeeping sets. Oh, so fun for kids. And typically developing kids really like to do this at about 18 months. But again, for some of our little friends, um, it's much, much later. And so sometimes kids when they're at this level, you're almost revisiting what they did as, as toddlers, but you're gonna bump it up again, and now they're pretending. So instead of really you, you know, doing a couple sweeps of the broom and calling it done, they're really not, not only have, are they imitating like they did at that earlier level, now they're really pretending. Now they're really pretending that they're sweeping the floor. Now they're really, again, some of this is, is so cognitively based that you don't even really, uh, you, you've got to give them the words so that you'll know that it's happening and they know that it's happening, but you're bumping that up so that a child, again, uh, implements those elements of pretending even within an old theme that he used to use, like imitating household activities. All right, now we're kind of up to these higher levels. And let me just say, guys, it's hard sometimes to get our little friends with developmental delays up to this point. So some of you may be thinking, I have never, ever tried these level six and level seven things. And if you're a, an EI therapist like I am, primarily with toddlers, you may not have gotten here yet, but I wanna teach you how to do it because I think it's a really, really important concept. And so here we're talking about symbolic substitutions. And this is where a lot of parents sort of think we're going at the beginning with pretend play and look at how long it's taken us to get there. Look at all the steps that we've had to go through. So this is where we take things that Sally Rogers refers to in her fantastic book called uh, Early Start for Autism. She talks about taking things that are ambiguous, meaning they could represent several things and introducing one or two of those play elements into your play routines with a child and seeing what happens there. So this would be things like using a little bit of a paper towel as the blanket to cover up your character when he sleeps. And you'll say things like, oh, I need a blanket. Do we have a blanket? And you don't have a blanket. And you say, look, let's use this. Here's our blanket. And you really give a child the words for that. You are narrating and you are helping him learn to think symbolically. And so again, you might take a block and pretend that it's a cup and you'll say, oh, he's thirsty. Where's the cup? We don't have a cup. And you've left the realistic prop out on purpose, but now you are taking uh, something that, uh, you know, let me say too, another thing here is to be sure that the shape of the ambiguous item or the generic item that you're using matches close enough to what um, you're trying to pretend like it is. So for a cup, you would want something that's, you know, a cylinder shape. If you're pretending like it's a blanket, you know, you wouldn't use a spoon for a blanket. You're gonna get yourself something that looks like it's a cloth. So think about that too. A cardboard, a circular cardboard piece can be a cookie, it can be a pizza, it can be a hat, it can be a Frisbee. Think about that. Think about how many things uh, something could represent. I like this little triangular shaped block from my Bob the Builder set that's, you know, gosh, 15, 20 years old now. And think about, you know, oh, this can be a slide, it can be stairs. Just, uh, again, this is the part where we're creative. We're finally ready to kind of do that, where a kid has a symbolic substitution. And if you are purchasing continuing education credit for 
uh, this course for five bucks. It, even if you don't need the credit, it may be worth your while just to get the handout for this so that you can see some other examples because I'll include that here. All right, so let's finish up with this last step where now we're really to true pretending because we're going to use some invisible substitutions. In the last step, we use symbolic substitutions. So we took things that looked like a cup, but now we're not even going to do that anymore. We're up to the point where our hand is a cup where we're really pretending. And then we could say, you know, for Bob, oh, Bob needs a drink, but where's, where's his cup? We don't have a cup. Oh, look, I'll pretend, here's our cup. And then, and some kids at this level will have to kind of go all the way back and they're gonna wanna pretend like their own little hands are a cup and they're drinking there or their hand is a brush or their hand is a washcloth. And instead of doing this on the character, they wanna go all the way back to the beginning where we talked about way back in step two, where they are using this invisible substitution on themselves. And then the natural thing would be what? They wanna use the invisible substitution on you and you can do that. And be sure that you're switching roles here. You, after, you know, you, you, you know, he's pretending he's gonna drink with his cup, you, with his little hand, you say, I wanna drink, can I have a drink? And if he has no clue about how to make that happen, you reach over and take his little hand and say, oh, my drink, my turn. And do your sound effects and keep it as fun that, you know, we've talked about this whole time. So do that for invisible substitutions too. And this is the point where kids either get it or where they get kind of confused. And I like to give kids both models at this point. You know, I might go back to the symbolic substitution where I've said, if he's not getting that we had the invisible substitution, that my hand is now a cup, you go back to the ambiguous substitution or the generic substitution where you're using the block. And then if he's still confused because you've just introduced too much too fast, go back and get the real cup where you're taking it and you're saying uh, something like, look, it's the same, you know, oh, you have the bottle, look, look, see, this is your bottle and this is your bottle and help him really make those connections. Don't forget in, in this that I didn't really mention that, that as you're going along, include more and more familiar routines for children to uh, include with this learning how to pretend. So things like taking a bath, eating a meal, We've talked about going to bed and waking up. Even things at this point, children, back in level five, and when they're moving up to level six, I hope that you've thought about expanding that to include things you're pretending like going to the grocery store, going to the doctor's office, or if a child goes to preschool, you're gonna pretend like you know, it's time for Bob to go to preschool or the cow to go to preschool. And you can act out those familiar things. When you get a kid here, it's also super helpful that you can anticipate what might be coming up. So a new thing would be happening. So you may get a little book, say a child is going to the dentist for the first time. You may get a book about going to the dentist and read about it and then you act it out with your characters that you've already been using in play. Or let's say that you're, you're gonna go take a trip or go to the library or something that you've never done with your child before. Use the characters that you have in anticipation of that event and talk about what's gonna happen when you go to the library. You know, say, oh, look, we're gonna go to the library and that's a big place with lots and lots of books and we have to be quiet. So let's pretend like daddy's going to the library and you would get your child's books out and you would, you know, again, run through that whole play scheme. First, we're gonna get in the car, we're gonna drive there, then we're gonna walk in and look, what do you see? We see books and then you would at this point bring out a book and read a little book with your child and then put it up and you say we went to the library and then you really go to the library and so then you pretend like that again so look at how many different avenues that you've given your child for not only learning about how things work in the world but you really really then at that point enriched your child's language environment so he's getting so many new opportunities to expand his vocabulary not only expressively with what he can say, but receptively for what he understands. And again, this is how we layer all of this, and this is how we work language in and really get kids ready to understand and use language. Uh, and it, it does really involve a, a good bit of practice and repetition 
even as we walk them through this whole process of learning to play. So I hope today I've given you those seven steps. Let's go back just as a big review. And therapist, you should be able to say these things. You should be able to quote this to a parent. You should say, well, first we have to teach him how to play functionally with toys. And then we have to teach him how to use familiar objects on himself. And then for step three, he has to use those familiar objects on you. And then we're going to combine uh, and let him use these, or then we're going to use those objects on a character uh, or like a doll. And then for step five, we're really combining lots of different objects and we're adding steps so that his play becomes so rich. And this is the point where, again, we use a little character, we use a doll as a play partner there. And so we have kids doing things with their little dolls or characters all day. And then and only then <clears throat> do we move forward to step six with that symbolic substitution. And we finish up with the granddaddy of all play skills, which is invisible substitutions. So I hope you learned some new things as a therapist today or as a parent. Uh, and again, check out uh, the written version of this material at my website, teachmetotalk.com. And if you're a therapist, you can get a one hour continuing education credit for only $5. There's uh, more information about that below. Thanks so much for joining me today. I'm Laura Mize, pediatric speech language pathologist, and you have just watched or listened to podcast number 382 from teachmetotalk.com. Thank